Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Varun Sriram with UCAN, and we are thrilled to present to you a very special talk on how to take control of your health and fitness in collaboration with Black Men Run, and absolutely thrilled to have two amazing, amazing guests who are going to share a bunch of knowledge with us as part of this discussion today. We've got Aaron Perry from Black Men Run. Uh, Aaron does a whole lot of other things in addition to being <laughs> part of Black Men Run, uh, but Aaron, thanks so much for for representing Black Men Run and also sharing your story with us today. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic, and we've also got Dr. Mark Kukazella. He's a family physician, he's a runner uh, in West Virginia. Uh, and Aaron, you're joining us from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm here on the East Coast, so we are spread across the country. But Dr. Mm -hmm. Mark, thank you so much for being okay, part of the uh, chat today. It's a pleasure <laughs> and a privilege to be on with Aaron, for sure. Yeah. Likewise. <laughs> well, you know, before we dive into it and, and really, uh, the purpose of this talk today is to both, um, you know, speak to the status of, of health for black men in this country. We want, we want to lead a little bit with that. And then also, um, from a proactive standpoint, uh, discuss strategies in terms of exercise and nutrition, factors that are modifiable that you can implement into your own life um, as you go on this journey to take control of your health and fitness. So whether you're just getting started with an exercise program or whether you're already part of a group like Black Men Run and, and you're out there and you're active and you're just looking for tips to up your game, um, you know, we hope this is going to provide uh, things for people all the way across the spectrum. Uh, before we get started, you know, kind of diving into the exercise and nutrition portion of this though, um, Aaron and Mark, you know, one of the two, uh, as, as we've talked uh, about this topic and, and brainstormed leading up to this, one of the things that struck me that, that really connects the two of you together in terms of being great voices for this discussion is that you're both really passionate about the health and in your community, you know, and improving the health, doing proactive things to improve the health in your community. Um, so Aaron, let's start with you. First of all, where does that passion come from? And, and, you know, can you just share with us an example of initiatives that you've undertaken in your community in, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin? Yeah, first and foremost, thank you um, for inviting me to participate. Thank you, Mark, for uh, welcoming me into your, your space. Um, but yeah, my name is Aaron Perry. I, um, I'm actually, um, if you can see in the background, I opened up a, a men's health and education center inside of a black barbershop. So that's actually where we're at right now. And I, I'm, if I appear distracted, it's because we see a lot of African-American men coming in the doors. They're all masked. They're all holding their son's hand, completely dispelling that myth that black fathers are not involved. Um, you come to the barbershop, you will see that. But I open up this uh, men's health and education center because of what we were seeing with this um, disparities and the, the, just the disproportionate number of men that were either um, losing their lives or you know be, having amputations. It was just a number of things that were happening, yet they were all preventable. And so we wanted to bring the medical community to a place where we knew that black men come and, and they come to the barbershop. Um, this particular location that I'm at, less than a 1% cancellation rate when guys schedule their appointments versus the doctor's appointments where they'll schedule appointments. One of the, the biggest complaints we consistently hear is that um, black men either do not keep their appointments or they show up too late um, to be seen. And so bringing medical here to the barbershop, we don't have that issue because when they schedule those hair appointments, they are here. And so literally they can get up out of the barber's chair walk right into our men's center. They can get a diabetes test. They can get um, daily blood pressure takings. We also do flu shots. We have a consultant that offers mental health, uh, substance abuse counseling, but any issues that our men struggle with, we're able to respond to that. Um, the other thing that I can say is that um, it's very important when you're in the community to know who you have in your community. And so I know that there's 15,600 black men in Dane County, which is in Madison, Wisconsin. And so we know what we're dealing with. And so we start looking at who resides in these underserved zip codes, and that becomes part of our strategy. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell, how we really got started on this. But again, I've lived with diabetes for 25 years, um, diagnosed with type 
two, as it turned out, two years later, I actually learned that I'm not type two. I was actually type 1.5, but we won't get into that. I'll let the doctor talk a little bit more about that. But just, you know, being diagnosed with diabetes and learning how my lifestyle changed. Um, I grew up in the inner city of Milwaukee. Well, there was a lot of drug abuse. And I remember telling my mom that I would never, ever use drugs and especially not needles. And you fast forward 30 years later, and now I'm diagnosed with diabetes. And the one thing that I promised my mom that I would never do, I have to do on a daily basis just to stay alive. And so it's been a challenge, but it's also been a good thing because as we learn about taking care of our diabetes, it, it is a condition that you can live very well with. You just have to get with your medical team and follow the advice of the professionals. Aaron, thanks, thanks for all that background info. You, you've been, you've done some amazing things, and I know for you, the the work is just uh, just starting in a sense. You're, you're, it seems like you're always pushing it forward and seeing what else you can do. Um, also, we're going to hear about it a little bit later, but uh, you're an amazing example of not somebody who's just living with diabetes, but somebody who's thriving, pushing <laughs> the envelope, doing some amazing athletic things. So we're going to give people that teaser, but we're going to get into that uh, a little you. bit later on in the discussion. Right. So thanks for that background. Um, Dr. Mark, similar question for you. You've, um, you know, in your community in, in West Virginia, you've done a lot to improve the health and fitness of folks uh, through your work at the hospital, through initiatives you've pushed at your hospitals. Um, tell us a little bit about that and, and also just where does your passion for health and fitness come from? Yeah, well, gosh, I wish, um, just to tag on Aaron, I wish we could open up one of these barbershops right next to or within every McDonald's and be checking yeah. people's blood sugar. <laughs> you know, we need like how many million, you know, billions and billions served. And maybe right. we can actually, you know, diabetes and obesity are undefeated, you know, mm -hmm. and they're only getting worse. COVID eventually will kind of wash through like any viral illness, but that pandemic global now of diabetes is not going away anytime mm -hmm. soon. And there won't be a vaccine for it. What do you think, Aaron? Is there going to be a vaccine for, for diabetes type 2, you know, anytime soon, you see? <laughs> well, you know, I do hope that there's a vaccine for COVID. And I've always said, yeah. whenever there's a cure for diabetes, I'm going to sit in the middle of the floor and I'm going to eat a big cake. <laughs> uh, yeah, like maybe type 1, you know, they're working on, you know, type 1, which Aaron has really is pancreatic insufficiency. He doesn't make it. And, you know, so there's some technology out there now, artificial pancreases, kind of dual loop pumps that kind of can substitute, you know, with some smart technology for what a pancreas will do. But people with type 2 actually are making too much insulin. They're resistant. So there's not going to be any way out of that other than nutritional therapies as, as mm -hmm. primary foundation. Just to make Aaron feel a little better here. So well, uh, this is like the one statement, maybe put it on the wall, make a poster. Well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of absolutely nothing <laughs> so, right because they tell you your whole life Aaron you're going to lose your eyes you're going to lose your feet gonna, I mean every person who's in your every African-American walking into your barber shop has a friend who lost their leg on dialysis mm -hmm. eyes and they're all told that you know diabetes causes this but poorly controlled meaning poorly understood poorly educated patients with diabetes will have those consequences but I absolutely believe that's not true and you're living proof so I'm also at what they call a type 1.5 I was diagnosed eight years ago on a military physical and I think everyone knows the term hard lockdown now <laughs> but uh, to keep my you know to keep my medical you know credentials and not get boarded they call it boarding in the in the military if you have a condition you're discharged I had to keep my blood sugars under good control and that was uh, without medications, because if I had medications, so I made just enough insulin if I, you know, kind of kept myself super, super low in carbohydrates, you know, my A1C would stay in that low six range, <laughs> kind of kept me out of trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we all learn, you know, it's kind of human experiments out there. But it, you know, so to Verone, your question, my community, you know, I'm in West Virginia, the number one obese and, and diabetes state in the country. And uh, all, all the states gradually are catching up to us because they're all going up. You know, our, our obesity rate in the state's about 45%, and that's that's not overweight. That's obesity. BMI is greater than 30, and our diabetes rate is about 20%. That's full diabetes, and many out there. So, Aaron, how many people walk into the barber shop and you do an A1C now or a random blood sugar, and there's no doubt they have full diabetes? How many would you say actually know they have it, and how many do you think that's an absolutely new diagnosis? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question because just um, last year we did a, a, just a big diabetes testing day. And in a four hour period, we had 46 men come through who were tested. Of the 46, 24 of them were indeed di diabetic. Now, these men were already under the care of their physician. They did not know. Yeah, for, for yeah, they did not. you know. Yeah, for high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, but what we're doing here is we're actually finding that a lot of these men are living with one or two chronic health conditions, and we're uncovering them right here from the barbershop. But to, to, to answer your question, we're, we're finding that almost sometimes 50% 50 of the men would, that are tested yeah. Yeah, are finding out that they are diabetic. Yeah, because young, you know, dudes like ourselves, we don't go to doctors, right? <laughs> especially because, yeah, I mean, we're seeing this with COVID, you know, especially African-American men, either, I mean, they're going to work and they're like, they're skeptical of the healthcare system. You know, mm -hmm. there's many roots to that, you know, many layers of why that is. You'd have more insight than I, but it's the same thing out here in rural West Virginia. You know, we may not be a community of color, but there's a lot of poverty, a lot of mm -hmm. inequity economically, a cost factors. You know, they've got to pay these high co-pays. They don't have insurance because last time they went to the urgent care, they got this $500 bill and now that's sitting in collections. So they, they're really skeptical to go in, but we had a, an African-American kind of a heritage festival so we brought the a1c kits out this was like two years ago you know the a1c now kits so like in three minutes and gosh i would say we picked up about 40 people that day who did not know they had diabetes mm -hmm. and that was maybe doing about like yeah we did about 200 tests some of them knew they had diabetes they just hadn't had their a a1c for those listening is a marker of your average blood sugar so it's there's different ways you can diagnose diabetes, but consensus states that that is a pretty good one. It measures a three month average. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so many out there and the pre-diabetes, which is essentially the same thing because it's going to drive, it's, it's like a little bit pregnant. Right? So well, I just have pre-diabetes doc. I'm fine. No, <laughs> you're not fine. Right. You're just going to the ground. <laughs> yeah. So I came back here after I was on a military assignment back to my hospital. I didn't know. I mean, I learned in med school, well, gosh, you know, just eat less and exercise more if you're overweight. If you have diabetes, you don't need to adjust your diet. Just give yourself a lot of insulin. No one taught us 10 grams of carbohydrates, raises your blood glucose 40 points. How much does one unit of insulin drop? You? I mean, no one taught us any of that. We just figured if uh, we gave someone enough insulin, we could manage their diabetes and Aaron knows that that's that, that batch of your sugar and your insulin is like a roller coaster yes, so you want to be yes. like this so we came this was six, seven years ago we started low carbohydrate meals in our hospital meaning you come in here and you have two options I can give you a standard American Diabetes Association approved meal with pancakes and 60 grams of carbs low fat of course because <laughs> that was the dogma we certainly can't eat eggs you know that was back then I eat like five a day but um with some insulin and, and they left the hospital with worse blood glucose control because it's all over the place or we could give you 10 grams of carbohydrates double eggs double meat extra salad the, the kitchen was involved it's like you couldn't even eat all that food <laughs> you know like right. three hard-boiled eggs on the salad you know they're and they're <laughs> laying there and they're not exercising they're in the hospital mm -hmm. and their sugars are flat and we'd lower their insulin in the hospital while not exercising. We'd take a type two, is on 200 units of insulin, massive amounts, and they'd leave on like 50 mm. while not exercising and no mealtime coverage. Wow. So, the, I mean, the proof of principle was there, and you know, we're still doing that. We've published papers on that protocol mm -hmm. because other hospitals are like, well, how do you do that? It's like, it's actually right. pretty simple. You just talk to your kitchen, talk to your nutritionist, talk to your pharmacist, talk to the doctors, talk to your nurses. The patients, if they do this, they can't get 12 different messages. Mm -hmm. You can't have one person saying those eggs are going to cause your heart attack and me coming in and saying, no, the eggs is beautiful food for diabetes. <laughs> right. but they have to drive on one side of the road, not both. <laughs> They'd be a problem. So, And they can choose, right? The patients have choice. Well, I'm too addicted to my bread. Well, then shoot up a lot of insulin <laughs> you know oh i love eggs you know my grandmother made me them every morning you good side of bacon and maybe we can cut your insulin back see how you feel check your sugar um and then uh, you know it, it, that really started to catch on here we had nurses losing tons of weight patients you know getting better right they're getting healthier not managed with more medication they're actually getting healthier reversing their diabetes which type ones you can't 
reverse it, but you can stabilize it. But type right. twos, you can actually make it go away. It's a type two is a dietary disease. So we huddled up the admin because it's like, like one patient actually told me one day, you know, we're having this conversation and they're bringing in a soda. <laughs> I guess the night before they ordered the standard meal, right? And there's a soda comes in. They're like, doc, you're telling me that this soda is freaking killing me. And here, why are you bringing me a soda? And they, you know, you're right. And so we got soda out of all sugar drinks out of our hospital. It took about a year. That means all sugar drinks. Juice is sugar. And that's all sugar drinks, Gatorades, photos and all that stuff not just for patients but in the cafeteria in the vending machines on the nursing stations so yeah and that was two years ago we finally got that approved over two years ago and um no one's asked for my head yet so that's good with a program like that and, and there's perhaps some similarities to what aaron's doing as well um for both of you when people are being armed with the knowledge, you know, the why. So it's not just we're taking sugar drinks out, but there's sort of a strategy and they feel invested in it. You're, you're talking to them about the blood sugar and insulin control. Like how much did you feel like that helped with the buy-in? And, and Aaron, that's where I have a similar question for you, you know, even as you're fighting against, you know, distrust in the healthcare system and providing people with another option. Like, like how much do people, when you can get them in that trusting environment, essentially want to be proactive partners in their own health. Um, Mark, I'll start with you and then Aaron, I'd love for you to react to that as okay. well. I think this fits to what Aaron's doing because all change in health is, is bottom up, community driven. You know, it's not top down, you know, it, it's bottom up, you know, the, so when our nurses are seeing this happen, you know, the staff, we had one of the folks who cleaned the rooms had lost over a hundred pounds doing this. You know, and certainly she was exercising 30,000 steps before she lost that 100 pounds, you know, in a hospital, right? She would show me her little Fitbit every day. And, you know, and I, I would need to like self-inflict a 13 mile run to get that many steps, but she's getting it. But it was just carbohydrates and, and lost the weight, you know. So when the people are driving at the staff, we had kitchen staff that were losing weight and coming off diabetes meds, you know, so, so it was that you couldn't kind of eight years ago, top down and say, you know, hi, I'm Mark, I believe sugar's killing you. And the rest of the staff is like, no, <laughs> it was, it's, and that's why I think it's slow change out there in bigger hospital institutions. I'm, I'm standing right now in my hospital, 24 bed hospital. So it's a small rock. It's easier to move a small rock than a big rock, you know, just like any system-based institutional change, right? Whether it's a large hospital, a university, American Diabetes Association. These are American Heart Association. These are big groups mm -hmm. that, yeah, it, it ultimately change happens. USDA dietary guidelines, <coughs> another one that's been a disaster for children feeding them chocolate milk in schools. Like, geez, what, what, if you drank a, a, a quart of chocolate milk, Aaron, what would happen to your blood sugar? Uh, it would definitely spike. <laughs> like, big time, right? <laughs> yes. We're feeding that to like six-year-olds. Mm. Uh, wow. They're, and it's a liver disease at a heart type two. So they're, they're mm -hmm. developing fatty liver in kindergarten now. Right. So Self-inflicted by, by us. So get people to understand it. If they understand it, it's not a belief system. They just need to understand the drivers of it from a societal, economic level, you know, policy level, mm -hmm. community level. Because at all these, this is the, the big, the big circles is the community when they find me in the ICU because their creatinine is seven and they need dialysis, we can't wait till then to treat them, mm -hmm. for, you know, prevention. Right. right. Yeah, go yeah. Ahead. yeah. And I can tell you one of the things that we do here is we partner with the Edgewood College nursing program. So we have seven uh, nursing interns. They do an internship with us for eight weeks. Uh, in addition to the uh, students, we also have two UW medical students, second year medical students, and they come in on the weekends to assist us with um, the brief consultation, um, you know, blood pressure screenings, helping um, our men understand um, their, their levels. But we also have a pharmacist that volunteers to come in, and what she does is she'll read their um, she'll, they'll bring their uh, medication and she'll read it to them and tell them what this medication is doing to their bodies, which is something that doesn't happen often. Mm -hmm. But the neat thing about having the students come through here, people have always said, you know, Aaron, I know what 
they're giving you, but what are you giving them? Well, most of the students are probably 99.9% .9 they're white, male and females. And what I tell them is that we're building cultural competency. And so that when they get in the field, they are prepared to work with communities of color. And there won't be that kind of that disconnect or trying to learn all over again. And so these are some of the powerful things that by bringing the community into this space where we know men congregate, that's been a bonus. Uh, I really like, as I'm listening to you, Mark, you have the hospital, I have the barbershop, and boy, do they, when we start to bring those together, mm -hmm. I, I really think that this is the model for the future, combining these two places, especially when we look at the uh, disproportionate number of black men, especially during the COVID-19 era, just the disproportionate number of black men that are being harmed by this, this dreadful disease. So, but definitely um, having the students come in and be a part of this support and teaching them so when they do go out in the field, they are prepared. But something else you said, Mark, was very important about bringing in the dietitian and the doctors. I've always stated that we have to get comfortable developing uh, uh, or working with our medical team, the nutritionist, the diabetes educator, your primary care physician. You we, we're teaching our men or guiding our men to get comfortable establishing a medical team and not only just establishing the medical team but following up on their recommendations and we all start that right here from the barbershop it's so interesting when you when you think about starting it from the barbershop where you know it's probably true for for so many men but it's like i've seen the same barber for 35 years you know i want to update them when something happens in my life you know it's like i don't feel that way about my doctor you know i've seen a number of different doctors over time and as you've moved around and so but, you know, why wouldn't you want to have that relationship with your doctor or whoever's taking <laughs> care of your health? Right. You know, that perhaps there's no, nobody more important to have that type of relationship with. So right. really starting it from a place of comfort can hopefully, you know, kind of cement those really important relationships and make people feel more comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, go ahead. I have a question for Aaron on that one, because, you know, one of the, it's, it's easy to kind of say, we'll go, you know, build a relationship with your doctor um, I'm a primary care doc, you know, family doc, and, and very, very few medical students go into family medicine primary care. There are very few African-American medical students. There are very few African-American yeah. men me medical students are going to be primary care doctors. So when they go to the doctor, so they go to the barber shop and they see someone like them culturally, they, they have similar you know, lifestyle patterns. You know, where do they shop? Where do they exercise? What's their okay. culture? And there is probably something to that where there's like automatic trust and empathy. Like I'm living in your world. I understand your world. Now, do you, do you hear Aaron sometimes where they, because it's very hard to see the same doctor mm -hmm. every time. Most just go to urgent cares, but how many, how many of the people coming to the barbershop, Aaron, are comfortable going to that I even identify, man, I got this good doc, Dr. Jones, you know, right. he listens to me, he has time, I can get a hold of him. And it doesn't matter whether they're the same color or not, but how many even have that type of relationship? Or nurse practitioner, physician right. assistant, someone who can prescribe, even a mm -hmm. pharmacist that they go to constantly. Pharmacists in this country, we need to be able to be um, providers and, and prescribe. They're super smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we do, um, we actually, um, one, of the, one of the goals of developing this space, we want it to be a bridge back to the medical community because um, when we do our surveys, the number one request that's identified and surveys, and so we opened up in 2016, this year we surpassed serving 4,500 men and there's, you know, 16,000 uh, 500 men in the county. We have some work to do, but we're still at roughly around, I believe, 20, 25 to 28% of engagement with men. Um, the thing that we are working on doing is, for one, when we give them those surveys, we don't just go through them I and mean, we listen to them and we try to respond. We're, we're really happy to be completely 
what we call clientele centered. And that is everything that we do is focused on what these men have indicated that they want and that they need. Um, the other part is tapping into that relationship with the barbers. Now, all of these men, and, 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 and you guys stated, when you go to the barber shop, do you trust your barber? Yes, you do. You have to trust them <laughs> or you'll walk away looking yeah, messed hair. up. But, but you, yeah, but so we've tapped into that, that oh, trust. Oh. And so anytime we find some resistance from men or let's say, for instance, at the end of the week, I go do and I look at the data of what we've had. If we're seeing that there's not a lot of men coming into uh, the, the into the men's health center, I'll go out into the barbershop and say, hey, wait a minute, guys. You wanted this. It is here. Let's use it because if it's not used, the doors will close and instantly we see 28 to 30 blood pressure screenings right away. But but part of that is tapping into that trust that these men have with their barbers. Uh, one of the things that we utilize the students for is that we actually taught all of the barbers uh, how to do blood pressure screening. So they're all equipped with that knowledge, but we also taught them about looking at different, you know, whether it's dark line behind the neck. And Mark, you can probably speak to that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's hyper insulin, it's high insulin. Yeah, yes. like skin tags, they call it acanthosis nigricans. It's yes, and so the student. diabetes from the skin. Yeah. <laughs> in 10 year olds now, <laughs> right? I'm not making that up. It's oh, easier no. to see in, in, the, in the white children. Um, but you can also see, if you look closely in African-Americans, see mm -hmm. these lines. Yeah, and, and, and training and, and teaching the barbers to identify these things and, and share that information, and not only with the, uh, their client, but also sharing with the medical students that come in. But these are all part of kind of moving this forward and being this really completely out of the box thinking of how we re-engage men especially stubborn men, how we re-engage them into the, the medical community again. Now, Aaron, you, you know, there's, there's, and perhaps there's, there's crossover um, between these men or, or maybe there's not, but you know, you work with a lot of men who you see um, through the barbershop and then you're also part of Black Men Run and yes. you know, you're, uh, you know, I wouldn't say work, well, perhaps working with, but also socializing with men who are perhaps more, um, proactive in the sense of like taking control of their own health and fitness and, and joining a group like Black Men Run. How do you see the attitudes about, um, you know, healthcare and seeing the doctor and getting screened differ from those two groups of men? Or, or do you see, still see, you know, similarities even in men who are, you know, more proactive about their health and fitness by in, in terms of exercising and joining a group mm -hmm. like that? I would say probably the number, if I can pinpoint one area, it, it was when I started to talk about being diabetic, it, it was almost as if I gave permission to other men to talk about their health problems. And I know that when I was initially diagnosed, I was scared. Um, I, I thought I was going to die. Um, I'm, I'm being told that as of today, you have to give yourself uh, a shot with a needle um, all these things were just messing with my, my, my emotional health, my mental health. But as I got comfortable and started accepting that this is the hand that life dealt me, and I got I to gotta figure it out. And that's what I did. But as I started to learn how to navigate life with diabetes, I just started talking more about it. Any opportunities that I get to go into the community, uh, do any public speaking, I've spoken to a lot of the churches here. Um, but as I start to talk about diabetes, it's, it's almost as if I've given permission for these other men to come in and start disclosing you know, some of their health challenges. And once we get men to that point, again, when we look at the surveys, if we identify someone saying that, I'd love to work out, but I, I just live in a high crime area and it's not safe. Um, I, I would love to work out. I'd love to join Black Men Run. And so what we've tried to do is develop various routes, even if there's not a group run in that specific area, we will go out there and we'll help that person identify a safe route to run. Um, but again, trying to keep that group setting, um, that, that social cohesion together, that is kind of what Black Men Run has done. But again, 
tapping into the surveys, hearing these men say, I want to lose weight, I want to I want to start exercising. And that's really when our Black Men Run program comes into play. Um, I had to be careful in the beginning because, of course, I've done an Ironman before and, you know, to my credit, um, became the world's first African-American diabetic to do an Ironman. And so that was a extensive media coverage from that. But that, that was 15 years ago. I, I'm not that man today. You know, I'm, I'm about 40 pounds heavier. Um, but I had to be careful of talking about Iron Man because a lot of our men would say right away, I'm not interested in doing no Iron Man. And I said, oh, wait a minute. You know, that was that guy 15 years ago. I still get up every morning and put my health first. I do something for me okay. before I start my day. And I've encouraged them to do that. I've also heard men say, I just don't have enough time. And this is when I really love to get into that discussion. I said, oh, wait a minute. There's 1,440 minutes in every single day. Research says if you just take 30 of those minutes, just 30, you will likely live a, a good life. And so that's where we start putting that information out, taking away the excuses, but bringing those guys into Black Men Run. Some will tell you, I have an old football injury. I, I can't run. I said, that's okay. We got someone that will walk with you. Um, just yesterday, I did a 6.2 mile walk with a guy who thought he couldn't walk any more than a mile. Next thing I know, I showed him my watch. I said, you know, we just finished a 6.2 mile walk. And he was like, no way. And I showed him the watch and he was just blown away. But what was going on is that we were talking and walking. It's that social aspect of it, that social cohesion. So all of these things come into play. You just got to get creative. I got a question for you, Aaron, on that, on that kind of thought, you know, to, for permanent behavior change, you know, people really kind of change their identity, you know, so maybe before diabetes, you know, you, you wouldn't have identified yourself as a runner or an athlete, and maybe you were, but a lot, are you seeing people after they've come back, you know, several times, they kind of change that identity a bit, mm -hmm. you know, even, even though they may not do an Ironman, look, I'm, I'm part of this run group now, I'm a, right. I'm a runner, or I'm a walker, I'm an athlete, <laughs> you know, I'm an athlete again, and then it's stickier, you know, they're not just exercising, I think, for permanent, I see that happening in my community with some of the local mm -hmm. run clubs. You have people that show up that two years ago never would have identified themselves right. as runners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they couldn't yes. even get off the couch. <laughs> you know, five k maybe first, and now right. they want to do this. But yeah, what, I mean, are you witnessing similar? Yeah, you know the old saying that if you hang out in the barbershop long enough, you're, you're going to get a haircut. Yeah, I, I, I tell <laughs> I people. Like if, yeah, I tell people if you hang out by the Ironman triathlon, eventually you're going to do yeah, a I'm triathlon, do thing, right? you know, like <laughs> like, there's a grandma out there finishing this thing yeah, I'm and in, next year. It's, right. And so right? what we do is anytime we do any group runs, we post those photos on social media. And, you know, these are men from all walks of life. We have the extremely obese person to the very fit person and everything in between. But we post those photos and we always share a, a great story about what we did, uh, the challenges that were met. We always post the times. And we do that for that reason of just encouraging men to not think that they cannot do this. We would hear that a lot, especially when there was popular 5Ks that are going on in the community. I've actually heard men say, oh, no, that's not for us. That's for white people. And we said, no, that is actually for us. This is your community, too. And so we engage them. The other most important thing that I would share with anyone that's listening, if you are looking to encourage your community to get more active, go and get people from your community and go and volunteer for an aid station. Just go take the community with you and volunteer for an aid station. Let them see people that are coming of all walks of life that are really trying and pass them that water and say something encouraging to them. We have seen by doing aid stations, we've encouraged more people to say, I want to do that. 
And so that's one of the things that I hope that comes out of this is just, just get your community together, get them involved in all these community events, even if it's just doing an aid station. And Aaron, for you, um, you know, you mentioned the Ironman that you competed in. It was, it was 15 years ago, but the, you know, for you at the time, like it was pretty improbable for, or, or at least for people around you, it was pretty improbable that they thought that you were going to be able to complete an Ironman, right? So it's, I mean, it's really a true testament to right. there's never, and, and I'd like you to share a little bit kind of about the circumstances that went into you undertaking that first Ironman and kind of like how you felt about the, the prospects of finishing it. But um, I think, you know, as people hear that, they'll really learn that anybody can do anything. So why don't you share a little bit of that with us? Absolutely. Yeah. When I first set out to do my first Ironman, actually, I watched Ironman for four years. I'm literally, I was down at the finish line. I'm in tears as the athletes are crossing because it's so emotional. And you know that most of these athletes have been exercising if you're if it starts at 7 a.m. and I'm at the finish line at 11.30 at night, you know that they've put in a whole day of exercise. And so I always went down just to, to, to cheer them on. And again, be careful of going and hanging out at an Ironman. You may get the, get the bug, you know. And that's what happened. I, I, I thought, Aaron, if you're this passionate and if this is so emotional, just do it. And so I started training, and I had no idea what to expect, but I hired a, um, a triathlon coach, and the, the thing about my coach, he had more confident, confidence in me that I, I just didn't have. But I also, here I am, I'm talking about doing the Ironman with my friends and with my family, and the reality is no, no one believed that, that I could do it. But, but, but I didn't even believe that I could do it, but I knew I wanted to give it a try. But, you know, just like with anything, you start off the training, you start slow, and it gradually builds up. But the neat thing about starting my training program, I started to see the weight loss happening. It was slight, but it was happening. I, I started sleeping better. All of a sudden, I'm drinking more water. I'm being conscious of, of you know, uh, how many hours of, of sleep that I'm getting. All of those things started to come together together. And now all of a sudden, it's six months into my training. Now I'm still not confident that I can do an Ironman, but I'm also loving how my body is transforming. When I think about you, Can, and I think about the, the nutritional supplements, I was never a, a supplement person, you know, but I knew that I needed that, that little bonus. And so I started taking a few supplements. And the next thing I know, it started balancing out and working very well with my diabetes. And now I'm literally, you know, nine months into my training. Um, I remember when I set out to do an Ironman, my first thought was, I just want to look like an Ironman, you know, and all of a sudden, nine months into my training, I didn't even care about what I looked like. Uh, other people were saying, my goodness, you look fit. But I tell you, I went from 246 pounds uh, or 36% or um, body fat to on race day, I was 3% body fat. I was 180 pounds. And again, but I still, in my head, I was not confident that I can get through uh, the Ironman, even though I was putting the training in. But every step along the way, what benefited me the most is I learned how to utilize my nutritional supplements and I learned how to make high endurance training and diabetes work as a team. And as I started to have that success, I remember I just started, I started feeling better. My confidence level grew. But when I did my first sprint triathlon, um, I literally, when I got done, I thought, wow, it's over already. It, was just, it just took me an hour. Um, several years prior, I would have been out there all day, but it took me an hour to do my first sprint triathlon. And the following week, I did my first half Ironman. And I just remember thinking that, yes, I'm diabetic, but I am a different person today. And I'm thinking everyone that will listen. Um, and then literally 60 days from that half Ironman, I was taking on the full. Um, I'll never forget the night before 
Iron Man, I thank God because I was just a different person. I was confident, still not knowing what the day will bring, but I knew that I would get out there and do my best. But I remember lining up with all of those athletes, 2,400 athletes from around the, around the world. And I remember thinking 362 days ago, I did not think that I could do this. And here it is, I'm now lined up with 2,400 of the most fittest athletes in the world, and I'm getting ready to take on an Ironman. And it's just sheer determination, but I look back at all of the people that pushed me and encouraged me, there was more people that were discouraging me because they did not think I could do it than there was people in my corner. But you start focusing on that mental toughness. I believe some of the nutritional supplements that I was taking benefited me quite uh, very much it benefited me but when i look at just the overall program and all of a sudden i'm lined up with iron man the cannon goes off and the swim is on <laughs> so i remember making sure i tested my blood sugars it was 142 so i'm in the swim i'm doing my thing it took me an hour and 57 minutes to do my first Ironman swim. So 2.4 miles down. Now it's time to do the 112 mile bike. I check my blood sugars. My blood sugars are 102. All of that was telling me is that I was nailing my training. So I do this 112 mile bike ride. It took me eight hours and 47 minutes to do it. But I remember getting off the bike and thinking, Aaron, you have just a marathon left and you will be an Ironman. But back in the, deep in the back of my mind, I knew that that had never been uh, African-American diabetic that had did the Ironman. And so, yes, I was thinking about that, but now I just want to hear that race official call my name. And so <laughs> I get through that first 13.1 miles. I did it in two hours and 10 minutes, the fastest half marathon that I've ever run. And at that point, I said I did not care what happened because I knew in my mind and in my heart that I was an Ironman. So 13.1 miles left, check my blood sugar. It had spiked a little bit. It was up to 220. I was a little concerned about whether or not I should take insulin, but I thought, you know what, Aaron, just get through this, you know, 26.2 miles. It actually took me about five hours to complete it. Um, the strange thing is, as I'm coming down that 100 yards, I remember passing a lady. She was standing in the same space that I stood for four years watching Iron Man. And she's saying to me what I was saying to all of these different athletes. I'm coming down this hundred yards. I am emotional. I, I, people are screaming my name. I'm thinking, how do all these people know my name? I forget it's right on your bib, <laughs> you know? But it was such an emotional moment for me. But hearing that man say, Aaron Mike Kelly, the Ironman announcer, said, Aaron Perry from Madison, you are an Ironman. And I crossed the finish line. And, you know, it was just one of those moments where even when I talk with people who are diabetic, I tell them, you don't have to do the Ironman. Just make that 5K your goal. If, if you want to bike uh, uh, 20 miles, make that your goal. But develop a goal. Stick with it. Find a trainer, find the community that gets behind you and support you. And, and that's kind of my story and where I was at. But again, finishing the Ironman with diabetes 362 days prior, I did not think it was possible. And so that's something that I own. I, I, I think my the, the uh, definitely all of the people that participate in the aid stations, uh, the volunteers. I go back and volunteer now. I'm a regular volunteer because I know that that is what got me through. It's really an amazing story to, to hear you tell it. And it speaks to the power of what you were talking about a little bit before, you know, where it's not about hearing Iron Man and knowing immediately you can do it. It's But when you hear other people who 
have started from where you were and then finish the Iron Man. It tells you if you put in the work, you know, if you start out, like you, you talked about the other day, if you start, or a few minutes before, if you start out, just run walking, you know, that in itself is going to put you on the, the path to making those incremental improvements. And then, you know, maybe one day you will be able to do a Iron, Iron Man or not even maybe one day, you know, maybe after <laughs> six months of training or, um, so it's really powerful. Uh, Mark, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to jump in and, and react to anything there. No, it's just powerful stuff. You know, just one thing Aaron said, when people say they don't have time to get some movement in, you know, like even the word exercise will intimidate people. It's like, well, you, you better have some time to be a, a medical patient later in life. <laughs> right. That takes a lot of time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you probably got people coming into the barbershop needing to go to dialysis three times a week. You know, that's, right. a, that's mm -hmm. a taxing thing. That basically becomes your life. But yeah, medical patients, you know, chronic medical patients, you know, that becomes a time budgeted item. So that, that uh, half hour of, of activity just reduces your odds, you know, not, yes. none of us are going to get out of this alive, but no, I mean, like, like Aaron said there, you know, just set a goal, you know, and um, I think when they, people set little goals and, and then they get motivated to do something bigger if they want, because it's, it's out there and it makes us human, right. you know, I mean, if, if that's why we're here is to do challenging things. You know, and it doesn't need to all be athletic. Maybe someone out there wants to, you know, compose a symphony, write a book, you know, <laughs> right. find a cure for COVID. Yes. <laughs> you know, someone's working on that right now, a vaccine. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, just have passion and right. do it. But, uh, you know, I'm glad you mentioned actually how far an Iron Man is because sometimes people listen to this and they don't know what that is. You know, they've heard a triathlon, but they don't realize. <laughs> Well, was that the Wisconsin Ironman or did you call Yes, uh, Ironman Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yes. yeah. So, yes. man, did you have a lot of friends out? Like, did you commit to other people, say, look, I'm, or did you just kind of sneak up to the start line kind of humbly and quietly? Or did, did you have friends who knew you were doing this that you committed to and said, yeah. look, I'm going to finish? Because that's, that's yeah. important, too. It, right. it, if you tell your best friend, I'm going to finish this Ironman, you better mm -hmm. be careful. <laughs> right, right. You're on the hook. Yeah, you know, I, you know, a couple of things that I share with people, um, most important, don't let illness force you to exercise. Get out in yeah, front of yeah, that, yeah. because we get hear that a lot, that people literally wait until they get sick. Oh, I'm going to start an exercise program. And, that, you know, we did, and that's one of the things that came out of doing the Ironman is that I've just been encouraging people when I get an opportunity to go around and talk. I tell them, do not let illness dictate your exercise program. And so first and foremost, I like to put that out there. But the other thing is, you know, um, no matter what you do, just, you know, stick with it. Uh, just even even if no one else believes that you can do it, you find your passion, stick with it. Um, if you are in need of, for instance, for me, I couldn't find guys that wanted to to exercise with me and so I started going out even though my training program called for a 90 mile bike ride and a 15 mile run I decided this day I had some guys that said man I'd love to exercise with you but I'm not doing that well I said what do you want to do and so I exercise with them. You know, I made sacrifices with my own training because it was more about the, the greater good um, of just having these guys come on board. But ever since I did the Ironman, I literally put up a website. And today, when I did it, there was only seven, um, seven diabetics that had did the Ironman. Today, there's well over about 500, but I wow. remember, uh, yeah, of that number, I probably talked to about 300 of them because they reach out and they say, you know, I want to do this. You think it's possible? And I said, absolutely, it is possible. Just go down and hang out at the Ironman. You will catch the bug. <laughs> there's something you mentioned there too, Aaron, just that I've learned, you just from doing endurance sport is that, you know, with the supplements and the electrolytes. So like the people drink a ton, especially in summer, they drink a ton of water. And unless you're getting that sodium in there, the electrolytes, so you don't need, you don't need, need the sugar, you know, necessarily, unless you're out there a really long time, but, but those electrolytes are, are critical. And I, I find that like, you know, I've got a monitor in my arm, my sugars are just like rock stable. If I've got, you know, I don't need to be eating, my body will 
make the glucose, but the <laughs> electrolytes just keep the brain and every everything kind of running well. You know, and the hydration system. I Meaning we got to drink right, these right. fluids everywhere and and not just feel like we're gonna just yeah either yeah. too much or too little. Yeah, well, the young man that I took out with me yesterday, um, again, the goal was he, he just wanted to do a mile or two. Uh, he was not confident at all. I said, you know, just hang in there, man. You know, we'll just talk our way through it. I actually did fill up my, my you can, you know, <laughs> bottle and I put a little, I put the supplement in there because I, I think I was sharing that uh, I tried the you can products for the first time and I ended up doing, I, I walked 6.2 miles, but I ended up talking the entire time. And I thought, is, is that the supplement? Because that's never happened. Normally, I can talk maybe one or two miles, and then I have to shut up. But on <laughs> this day, I, I you know, took the You Can Supplements, and uh, you know, uh, it was the energy uh, supplement. And my goodness, it worked. So I, I gave uh, the bottle to my, my friend Jim yesterday. And the next thing I know, I didn't tell him this because I'm still waiting to really understand uh, the, the product, but but I can tell you this much, and, and it's not just you know me talking. Um, something happened with him yesterday that happened to me that he got through 6.2 miles. Um, he now believes, what, what was that that you gave me again? Because I want to try it again. So we're going to make sure that he gets some more of that product. Yes, but, you know, I, I, yeah, I tell people that, you know, give this stuff a try. Um, th this stuff didn't just show up on the market one day. This has been extensively researched. People have tried it. Um, you owe it to yourself to try these products and see how it benefits you. If there's no benefit, you move on. But um, I, I'm, I'm a believer in the product now. And it's really great, Aaron, to hear kind of your experience and also the experience of your, your training partner that you shared it with. Um, one of the things as, I, as we um, get close to wrapping this up that I kind of wanted to, um, Dr. Mark, have you talk about to put a bow on some of the nutrition concepts we've been talking about. Because, um, you know, we've mentioned blood sugar a number of times, insulin. Um, you know, Aaron's talked about his experience with regulating his blood sugars. And, you know, one of the the foundational pillars for good metabolic health is good blood sugar control and you know a byproduct of that being controlling your insulin and that's whether you're diabetic you're pre-diabetic or even if you have no concern of diabetes you know we could all benefit from regulating our blood sugar and one of the things that makes you can unique and kind of sets it apart from other products that you would use for exercise for for energy is that it's built around that premise of regulating your blood sugar and sustaining your blood sugar. So it's not a sugary drink that's designed to give you, you know, a quick burst, which, you know, may have benefits at certain points if you're doing ultra long endurance exercise, right, or, or sort of situationally. But if you're day to day walking or training or exercising, you want something that's going to regulate blood sugar. So, so Aaron, just from that basis, it's cool to hear about the experience you've had. Um, Mark, even just like outside of you can taking a, just a, a step back, can you can you speak to those principles of blood sugar control and insulin control? Help help us demystify them a little bit, maybe in, in as simple terms as you can. Like, what do those terms? What do they mean? Like, what impacts our blood sugar and insulin in terms of the nutritional choices we make, and how can we go about just strategically? You, you provided some ideas when you were talking about the dietary strategies in your hospital, but just to reiterate that. How can people go about making nutrition choices that aid controlled blood sugar? Yes, I'll take a step back. Gosh, like that's a million dollar question, but but I'll, I'll, I'll take it at first from the perspective of a non-diabetes patient, just a standard person out there living their lives and certainly someone that would want to be active and do sport. So our bodies really have two tanks. We can use glucose or we can use our own fats. When our bodies can actually utilize our fats as fuel, we're less reliant on sugar. Sugar is a small tank in our body, a little bit in our muscle, a little bit in our liver, just a scooch in our bloodstream. And someone who is in the diabetes spectrum, really they can't utilize that glucose system while it's dysfunctional. So they actually have to adapt into the fat burning system. And one of the non-negotiables in the physiology of this is is high insulin levels, which are spiked by carbohydrates, inhibit the body's ability to use fat as fuel. Now, most marathoners or endurance athletes will make this mistake, and sometimes they'll make it again because they don't understand it. 
you know, I think a, a training principle, if we actually understand the mistake, is never make the same mistake twice. Would that be true, Aaron? Like if you actually know the mistake? Right. Would, right? <laughs> All right, I left without a spare tire. I'm going on right. a 90 mile bike ride. Okay, I'm going to do that, right? Because think That's of all the correct. mistakes we make. You know, I'm not going to go swim in this lake on a, this type of day. You know, there's lightning in the air. You know, probably not. Right. <laughs> go run on this trail. Yeah, so say, for example, we're at, you know, I've met you at the Boston Marathon a couple times, and recreational runner, first Boston, they're all hyped up. They go to the expo and someone says, this is the best energy supplement. And it's loaded with carbohydrate. And they're told, well, you better boost up your sugar and your stores right before the event. So 30 minutes before that marathon, they go have some bar or eat a bagel or drink something which contains a lot of fast acting carbohydrate. Their insulin spikes. And when insulin is up, your body cannot use fat as fuel. Now, in the beginning of a marathon, we all want to conserve glycogen. All right, so Aaron, in that, in that marathon, you knew that you wanted to conserve those precious glycogen stores because your heart rate is going to be jacked the last 10 miles of the run. <laughs> right. All right, you want to be like cruise control. And then when you can somewhat smell the barn, you're like game on. So right. if you start the event and your insulin is spiked and you think you're you're doing a good thing, you're actually sabotaging yourself because you can't use the fat as fuel no matter how slow you run. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder, I hear it again and again, gosh, I was prepared, I was trained, I tapered, and I just, at 18 miles, I was just done. And they can't figure it out. It's because they, they did that. Now, those of us that kind of learn how to access our own fat stores, don't eat before we run, we go run. And if you're gonna go for a longer run, something like, so I'll take before a marathon, so I'll drink a shake of the you can super starch because that does not spike insulin. It gives kind of a slow, slow, slow glucose release or, you know, which is a, it's high molecular weight start. So it's a very slow, slow, slow. So for example, this is a continuous monitor I have on my arm. We'll just kind of see what a, a normal day is. So like this, if we can see the little line there, so that's pretty flat. I feel pretty good. My lunch was pretty good. And this little red spike there. So I went running in the morning and without eating, just running raises my blood sugar. But I had one tomato on my omelet. And um, that actually, if I had, didn't have that tomato, the tomato on the omelet, mm -hmm. it, it went up. But if I had like two bananas or something, <laughs> it'd be like off the rails. <laughs> right. And if I tried to exercise right, because we're told bananas are good, right? If I tried to do a run after that, I would have been crashing. It would have. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you find, Aaron, like when your sugars are like stable, you feel good? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. right? Mm -hmm. You just, you don't know what it is, but you just, you're not like hangry. And that's where the <laughs> electrolytes, I think, really matter too. So that when you're mm -hmm. in this, right, sodium balance, you know, and not too much, right? So there's, everyone's going to have their sweet spot. So you're going to go out a little longer. You know, can you tolerate 16 ounces of super starch, eight ounces and put some in a bottle? So again, everyone, but people can use like a monitor, you know, I would suggest this for the patients with the diabetes, something like that. No, and Mark, what you spoke about it from an athletic standpoint, what about just from, a, and see, so this is as authentic as it gets, right? Mark's in the hospital, he's answering phone calls. I mean, come on, this is, uh, <laughs> this is, this is uh, real life stuff. Every real life life stuff right right now. You're in the so clinic, that, right? So, I mean, this stuff. is weird. Like I said, we're not just talking to we're talking to two people who are living it and you're, you're seeing them live it on the screen in front of us. I think that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. uh, but Mark, just um, as a follow on to that. So we talked about blood sugar control for athletes and, and people who are active and kind of how it manifests itself in terms of, of energy. What about just blood sugar control for, for overall health? Um, what is yeah, the yeah. importance of it and how paramount is it? Yeah, so we're learning a lot about this. So high insulin, so insulin spikes. So insulin is an inflammatory growth hormone. So the more you have these spikes of insulin, meaning you, you eat a bagel, your insulin goes up. Now that insulin is going to store that carbohydrate. So there's always going to be some up and down, up and down versus flat if you're eating much more low carb. So we know these, there's two effects. So there's the high insulin, which has its own pathways of inflammation. And that's kind of the what we call more the vascular changes, the liver changes, macrovascular cardiac changes, the obesity is the insulin. Insulin's the storage hormone. But then we have more of these classic diabetes complications, which Aaron's constantly warned of. That's going to be the eyes, the retinopathy, the mm -hmm. kidney, 
disease, that's microvascular, some of the nerve disease, uh, gastroparesis, which is nerve. And that's due to what's called glycation. So we measure people with what's called a glycated hemoglobin, and that's a glucose marker. So the glucose does its own damage, high glucoses and high spike in glucoses. The high insulin does its own damage. High glucose and high insulin insulin together is, uh, is full catastrophe. And so I think in endocrinology now, we've shifted away a bit of just glucose-centric. Well, we can give you enough medicines to make your glucose better, but we know at the end of the day, the more medicines people are on to manage that, the worse their outcomes are. So we might make their sugar better. These are mostly the type twos. They die quicker. And it shouldn't be surprising because we're needing to give them 10 units of insulin, 20 units of insulin, 40 units of insulin, 60, 200, you know, and their liver is basically overstuffed and then they can't package any more away. It's super dangerous treatment. So less carbohydrates, less insulin, more stable sugar. Basic principle, you know, more carbohydrates, more insulin, more unstable sugar. That's right. Right. You know, I think every human out there, and this isn't me, as Dr. Richard Bernstein has published extensively, he's been type 1 Aaron since 1946, and he still goes wow. to the gym. Wow. Yeah, That's he incredible. calls it the role of small changes. You know, <laughs> so it's, He's an engineer, then went to medical school so he could treat his own diabetes. Oh, wow. Fascinating stuff. You know, he's, I'm <laughs> listening to this dude. He's going to the gym at 85. I'm going to buy right. his book. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, and he's fit, right? He looks good. Uh, he's yeah. He's still with yeah, and Mark, you said something that I, I really hope that 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 you know people that are listening take take that away because surprisingly, there are a lot of people that don't know what feeling good is. Yeah, they've gotten so comfortable with feeling bad that they just don't know what 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 when you get yourself to a level. Okay, I feel good. You know that should be the goal. If you're listening, look at the supplements, look at the nutritional supplements, that you in, include them in your plan, but get yourself to a level where go in and get your blood work done, go in, make sure you know what your blood pressure is, know what your cholesterol levels, but when you get to a point where you know you're nailing your numbers, just remember how you feel so that that's your measurement on days when you just don't feel good. Now you know what baseline you need to get yourself back to. But there are so many people that we interact with, they just don't know what feeling good is. They just got so comfortable with feeling horrible. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I, you know, when I'm in clinic with people, that's like the first question, how do you feel? Mm -hmm. Like if I gave you six pills and maybe your blood pressure looked a little better, but you felt like crap, it's not life isn't worth living i mean and there's probably no data that's really helping that person you know just because this number in the office looks better but when people feel good there's things i mean it just makes sense right your brain is working your mitochondria are working i mean you're making atp your metabolism is working your sleep is good you know you just wake up and you feel you're not depressed right you're All right yeah, you know, each medication has multiplicative side effects. You know, I'm I'm pro medicine in the right. I, I work in a hospital, and so I'm not like you know a medicine denier here. <laughs> but no, they have, you need insulin, right? But uh, we need to minimize it, and we need to make it less disruptive in people's lives. Simplify it, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's it's the more people fall off of these standards we set in the office, we intensify the management. Mm -hmm. Like we teach them, I'm glad the medical students are in the community. If you took your, you know, folks there in the barber shop, you know, and you had to intensify their medical management, and they already have three jobs, four kids. Yes. Like, how does that work in their lives? Yeah, yeah, and we it doesn't. Right? Yeah. yeah, like you know, make it simpler, doc, for me. You know, I don't have mm -hmm. like I forget. I can't take something four times a day. Jeez. Yeah. 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 And, and, and even being just my blood sugar, you know, that's a tough challenge. Right, and and even being in in the um in, in the barbershop here, where guys come in and you know just having a conversation with him, one of the guys mentioned to me that he, he just wasn't sleeping, and that what what got my attention is that he stated that his girlfriend told him, I think 
you're stopping breathing during the, and and he had never heard of that so, well have you heard of sleep apnea and he didn't so um, right behind me we have two computers one is set up to harvard medical as one is set up to mayo because what i try not to do is give medical advice i'm not qualified to do that so i just tap into these pro sites um, but we 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 pulled up you know what sleep apnea is and then after he read through it he said that that's me and I said, well, you know, there's something that you can do. You can have a sleep study mm -hmm. and then you can get a CPAP machine. And so what this young man failed to tell me is that his girlfriend actually kicked him out of the bedroom and he actually came back about four months later. He walked into the men's center and he was smiling. He said, I'm back in the bedroom. And I'm like, what, what happened? <laughs> he ended up getting the CPAP machine. He okay. followed through with the sleep study, got got the CPAP machine, and he said he's just sleeping right through the night with the love of his life right next to them. And that's what's most important is giving people their life back. Aaron, I'm so glad you, you shared that story because as I was thinking of, we, we've covered so much and there's been so much phenomenal information shared by both of you here. And as, as I was thinking about how do we put a bow on all of this? I think what, what you shared right there is, is really, you know, knowledge is power, you know, and, and if you are giving people the trust to arm themselves with knowledge about what's going on, if you're giving them the knowledge on how to invest in their own health and fitness, you know, through exercise and nutrition, like it, it, with both of what you guys have shared today, it seems like people who are given the knowledge by people that they trust in your experiences are willing to take proactive measures to improve their own health, you know, and I think the story you just shared is the, is the prime example of that. So while I could try to sit here and sum up a few of the key points on nutrition or health or exercise, I think ultimately, if you listen to this, um, you know, certainly one thing you should leave here with is prioritize your health and fitness and, and seek out places where you can at least find someone you trust who can give you that knowledge about what's going on with your own body. Because without that knowledge, there's no chance you're going to be able to do anything proactive or preventative. Um, so in, in um, wrapping up, um, Mark and Aaron, I just wanted to give both of you guys a chance to share where folks can um, connect with you, um, you know, get invested in what you guys are working in, get involved with what you guys are working on. Um, Dr. Mark, we'll start with you and any other closing thoughts you have um, about our discussion today. If you live anywhere near uh, West Virginia, but we're actually close to Baltimore, DC, we have a little running store we've had for 10 years called Two Rivers Treads. And I opened that, I own the store, because like most, <laughs> your know, heirs probably had a running injury, you go to the doc, they don't even get you off the table and they give you Motrin or inject you. But no, there's, there's so many issues with running injuries. So, so we actually built the store out as kind of a training and sports med model let's try to keep people healthy let's not just fix them when they're broken so you can come out to our store we do two rivers treads.com we're doing like every couple of weeks we'll do something at the store now we're starting to kind of re reopen those things again because you know we haven't wanted to gather so yeah come out there and you go online and uh, we have natural type of footwear you know we don't put people in big bulky heel elevated shoes we try to get them in things that make their feet work just like your metabolism you know I'm not, i, I want to teach you how your body works um I have a website natural running center where i'll put some blogs up um, I actually have my own site, drmarksdesk.com, and, and you can link. I wrote a book a couple years ago called Run for Your Life, which is probably a little bit about running, but more about health and aging and community. I have all chapter. The last chapter is about community, and I think that's the most important chapter in the book because all health, you know, outside of, you know, trauma, you know, those things that are true emergencies, uh, that's treatment. But most health starts at a community level. And it always starts with small change. You know, that's the only way it's ever been and it's the only way it ever will be. So read, read the book. I think there's something for everyone in the book. Coming out to my store, um, hang out there. Awesome. Don't, get, yeah. don't get admitted to my hospital. So I don't want to see. <laughs> right, I have a clinic, right, right. Like if you have diabetes, you could actually, you know, reach out to me. Um, my email is afrundoc, Air Force R-U-N-D-O-C at gmail.com. And I see patients with diabetes in my clinic to try to get them off of medications through lifestyle treatments. Um, Fantastic. So there's power in that, like to get people that are in that bend that like, I, I, I want to get out of this mess. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, go ahead. And, yeah, and for me, um, uh, if you reach out, to, if you even just Google Ironman Aaron, uh, there's so much information out there that, that will pop up. Please know that everything that you see and read, um, that is from a man that had no confidence. Uh, my diabetes was out of control. I had lost hope, um, but I started going and watching this incredibly emotional event and, and, I, and I got hooked. And I said, if I'm feeling that much passion, that a passion about this, Aaron, just try it, you can do this. And so trust the professionals. If you don't have people in your community that are willing to walk or run with you, um, create it, create that group for your, your community, take the lead on that. Um, reach out to some of the running and walking groups that are in, in your community. Black Men Run has just, in our area, just exploded. I mean, for, for heaven's sakes, we have the lieutenant governor that comes out and runs with us on a regular basis. Now, that dude is quick. <laughs> he, he, he's a runner, <laughs> you know, but uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, he comes out and runs with us. We do, uh, we do did the Madison Mini Marathon last year. He came out and joined that. Um, but, you know, please do not think that these things that are happening in your community are not for you. If it's in your community, it is for you. Just figure out how to be a part of it. Those are great words uh, by both of you. Just from UCAN standpoint, we really want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, as we talked a little bit about UCAN, it's a really unique nutrition product. It's something that will give you energy without the negatives of fast carbs or sugar, without the spike and crash, without the highs and lows. So really something you can incorporate both into your training uh, if you're active, but also if you are looking for just steady, long-lasting energy throughout the course of your day, you don't want something really sugary, um, incorporating the UCAN powders and bars that way in terms of just a tool along with a great you know, daily nutrition plan that comes from real food, you can, can be a tool to help regulate your blood sugar and, and keep you on that pathway to metabolic health. Um, for everybody who is tuning into this, if you head over to our website, youcan.co, you can use the code BLACKMENRUN, spelled out just like that, BLACKMENRUN, and get 25% off your first order. Um, but uh, you know, Aaron and Mark, just in closing, from, from my standpoint, you guys talked about the importance of a good team uh, having a good team surrounding you. Um, we're really lucky here at UCAN to have folks like Dr. Mark and Aaron, you know, willing to be part of our team and share their expertise and knowledge with everybody. So um, we feel very fortunate to that, uh, you know, to have that um, ability to bring folks like you on and, and do things like this. And hopefully for people who are interested in being proactive with their health and fitness, um, we can help you, uh, you know, be part of the UCAN team and get great education and uh, knowledge from people like Mark and Aaron. So really want to thank you guys both again for, for joining us today. That's a privilege. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, everybody. Uh, this full recording will be available for you to listen to anytime, and we will see you next time. Take care. All right. Take care.